the oddities. I did not quite follow or understand. Not a Pax Americana. Will America give open citizenship rights to Ahmadiyya's of Pakistan? If it is not, then I say America shut up. The West often lectures India on topics like religious freedom, democracy, and the rights of minorities. Without really understanding the situation, they just say whatever comes to mind, without knowing much about it. The most recent example is their comments on India's implementation of the CAA. Before we go further, let me give you a short understanding about CAA. The CAA is a new law that makes it easier for non-Muslim migrants from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan to get Indian citizenship. It applies to those who arrived in India before December 31, 2014. The law offers a pathway to citizenship for individuals belonging to specific religious groups such as Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jains, and Parsis, who migrated from these countries due to religious persecution. It reduces the qualification period for citizenship application for non-Muslim migrants from 11 to 5 years. Regarding the CAA, there are some voices in India claiming it discriminates against Muslims. Even foreign media outlets like those in Europe, the US, and Al Jazeera even calls it a devious anti-Muslim dog whistle. However, the reality is quite different. The car's aim isn't to target Muslims, but to provide citizenship to those who have faced persecution in neighboring countries. India is home to over 200 million Muslims, making it the third largest Muslim population in the world, after Indonesia and Pakistan. But what about Muslims from these countries? Can they apply for citizenship in India? Well, the CAA doesn't affect their citizenship status. According to the Indian government, the law doesn't restrict Muslims from seeking citizenship either. In fact, Muslims from any part of the world are free to apply for Indian citizenship under Section 6 of the Citizenship Act. So, they can indeed obtain Indian citizenship, just like Pakistani singer Adnan Sami did in 2016. Now, to our viewers from the West, I have a question for you. How often do you hear news about the persecution of Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, and other minorities in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan? I'm guessing not very often, right? The situation facing Hindus and other minorities in Pakistan is deeply troubling, yet there hasn't been strong condemnation from the US or Europe against these atrocities. Instead, whenever Pakistan seeks financial aid, it seems readily available without much effort on their part. While the West often criticizes India's democracy, what about the state of democracy in Pakistan? The widespread rigging during recent elections was blatantly evident to the world, yet the US response was surprisingly tame, merely calling it a competitive election. We congratulate the Pakistani people, first of all, for participating uh, on the election on Thursday. It was clearly a competitive election um, in which people um, were able to exercise their choice. Voters came out in large numbers for Imran Khan, the former prime minister jailed and barred from running. His party, the target of a crackdown by authorities. And his candidates forced to run as independents. They pulled off a stunning victory in many parts of the country. The vote count was excruciatingly slow, marred by delays. That fueled anger and frustration from Khan's supporters, which boiled over as allegations of vote rigging piled up. This candidate for Khan's Pakistan Tariqa Insaf party took to Facebook to call it out. The mandate of the people has been stolen, he says. Amr Masood Mughal shows me the official election night document he says proves he won, only to have that result switched in the morning. It was clearly a competitive election. Europe, on the other hand, did criticize the elections for lacking a level playing field due to restrictions on freedom of assembly and internet access, as well as allegations of interference in the electoral process. But what about taking concrete actions? Well, Pakistan is currently seeking fresh loans, and the IMF is reviewing whether to release the final payment under a $3 billion bailout package secured last year to prevent a sovereign debt default. 
And as history suggests, it's highly likely that Pakistan will secure this assistance, just as it has in the past. Let me illustrate what's happening in Pakistan, with a recent incident that reflects broader issues faced by women and minorities there. A woman in Pakistan was rescued by the police after being mobbed by a befuddled crowd for wearing a quarter with Arabic prints. The mob mistakenly thought the prints were Quranic verses. However, the Arabic writings on the woman's attire were simple words, unrelated to religion, such as beautiful and halwa, a type of sweet. Despite this, the woman was taken to the police station and apologized for hurting religious sentiments. This incident is just one example of the ongoing persecution faced by minorities in Pakistan, where many have lost their lives. Why does this happen? It's because perpetrators have no fear of consequences, and the world often turns a blind eye. India, however, decided to take action for these minorities through the CAA. Through the Citizenship Amendment Act, India has reassured minorities in these countries that if they have nowhere else to go, they can consider India their home. In light of this, there's no necessity for India to justify its actions. Now, when it comes to the West, they often champion refugee rights worldwide, but oppose the CAA, meant to help refugees, despite using similar immigration policies themselves. Soon after India announced the Citizenship Amendment Act in 2019, the West went into overdrive, labeling the law as discriminatory. Western media echoed these sentiments, with attention grabbing headlines worldwide, thereby overshadowing the significant aspect that India aimed to grant citizenship to minorities originating from Muslim-majority nations. For instance, in 2020, the UK introduced a new immigration policy, similar to Australia's points system, prioritizing skilled individuals proficient in English. India didn't object, even though this English requirement have cultural biases. Let me provide another example, similar to the CAA. The United States has an impressive track record of telling other countries how to conduct their affairs of state. I believe the citizenship amendment was passed just recently. Uh, the way it, it looks like it's going to be implemented, it will be very discriminatory against the Muslim population, uh, which is very, very large. So do we have your commitment that you will be a voice in regards to any discrimination against minority groups such as the Muslim population within India? Absolutely, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you, Senator. And I would not only just bring it up, but it would not be something at the end as an obligation. It will be a core piece of what I'll be engaging uh, my Indian counterparts if confirmed. However, in 1990, the U.S. Senate passed an amendment, moved by Frank Lautenberg, that fast-tracked the immigration of Jews and certain Christian denominations from the erstwhile Soviet Union. Notably, individuals from these communities weren't obliged to demonstrate personal persecution. Later, in 2004, this law was broadened to encompass members of the Baha'i community escaping persecution in Iran. Hungary has consistently refused to accept refugees from Iraq, Syria, and North Africa because they believe these people wouldn't fit in. Similarly, other East European countries like Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia have shown they're not happy about taking in these refugees either. But I also admire my Polish culture and I want to preserve it. I want to nurture it. I don't want to, it to be destroyed by um, Muslim uh, migrants coming from the Middle East or from Africa. As the EU faces a migration crisis and Poland's new left-wing government shuts down the public broadcaster, I'm joined by the former Conservative Prime Minister of Poland. Are you worried about the rule of law in Poland? following the closing down of the public broadcaster by the new government. I am afraid of what is going to happen uh, quite soon because uh, we experience um, uh, unprecedented um, uh, happenings. First, uh, you know, public television um, broadcasting has been cut and millions of polls uh, could not uh, get any access to information. This has happened uh, for the first time 
um, in a uh, number of in decades. Uh, last time when it happened, it was uh, during, the, during martial law in 1981, uh, when uh, the TV uh, prog programs were, were cut. Um, so that's the, unprecedented and I am uh, afraid of what can happen next. Regarding the Syrian refugee crisis, the Gulf countries, which are the wealthiest states among the Arab world, are among the largest donors to Syrian refugees. However, they do not take in refugees to their own countries. On the other hand, the Citizenship Amendment Act of India has a historical premise. The Liaquat Nehru Pact, signed after partition in 1950, aimed to safeguard minorities in the divided subcontinent. The agreement ensured complete equality of citizenship for minorities, irrespective of religion. It also promised security in life, culture, property, and personal honor, along with freedom of movement, occupation, speech, and worship, subject to law and morality. India fulfilled its part of the deal, leading to a minority population growth of over 5% in seven decades. However, Pakistan and Bangladesh didn't honor their commitments. Now, you might ask, why India doesn't provide special consideration for Shia and Ahmadiyya communities, given their persecution in Pakistan. The rationale behind this is rooted in history. Both Shia and Ahmadiyya groups were active participants in the movement that led to the creation of Pakistan. India is not obligated to protect them from one another now. What about the position of Indian Muslims? The chief of the All India Muslim, Jamaat, stated he welcomed this law. He said, this should have been done much earlier, but better late than never. He even said, there are a lot of misunderstandings among the Muslims, regarding this law. This law has nothing to do with Muslims. So you can see, Western countries have implemented similar immigration policies, but hypocritically lecture India, without understanding its history. Fortunately, India, has begun to push back, and that with brutal determination. The CA is about giving citizenship, not about taking away citizenship. So this must be underlined. It addresses the issue of statelessness, provides human dignity, and supports human rights. As regards the U.S. State Department's statement on the implementation of CA, and there have been comments made by several others, we are of the view that it is misplaced, misinformed, and unwarranted. India's constitution guarantees freedom of religion to all its citizens. There are no grounds for any concern or treatment of minorities. Vote bank politics should not determine views about a laudable initiative to help those in distress. Lectures by those who have a limited understanding of India's pluralistic traditions and the region's post-partition history are best not attempted. Will America give open citizenship rights to Ahmadiyyas of Pakistan? Will it give open citizenship rights to the poor Palestinians? If it is not, then I say America, shut up. The US envoy to India, Eric Garcetti, attempted to lecture India without understanding its history, only to receive a metaphorical slap in response. He said, in America, we feel very strongly about that sensitive borders need to be secured. We are a nation of immigrant citizens, we have been enriched by our diversity. Secondly, we understand India's security needs as well. We are well aware of this. But, the principles of religious freedom and of equality under the law is a cornerstone of democracy. He added, that is why we look at these things, it will be easier not to look at our friends. We invite you to do the same with our imperfect democracy, it is not a one-way street. But, you cannot give up on principles, no matter how close you are with friends. Well, look, I'm not questioning uh, the uh, perf imperfections or otherwise of their democracy or their principles or lack of it. I'm questioning their understanding of our history. Okay. I mean, if you hear the comments from uh, many parts of the world, it is as though the partition of India never happened. 
you know, and that there were no consequential problems which the CIA is supposed to address. So, if you d take a problem, remove all the historical context from it, sanitize it and make it into a political correctness argument and say, oh, I have principles and don't you have principles? I have principles too. And one of my principles is obligation to people who were let down at the time of partition. The response from India's Ministry of External Affairs was even more brutally cutting. And the US, the same country where former President Donald Trump issued an executive order in January 2017 banning nationals from seven Muslim-majority countries, including Iraq, Syria, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen, from entering the United States for at least 90 days. Those countries were named, in a 2016 law, concerning immigration visas as countries of concern.